This is What Does It Profit? And I'm your host, Dr. Dawn Carpenter. In this show, we talk about value, the social and moral value of business. Each episode, each guest will bring me a little closer to finding out what does it profit. All right, most of you know I'm a former investment banker turned business ethicist and that I have the heart of a teacher, whether here with you or as a storyteller on Wall Street. And if you haven't figured it out just yet, I'll tell it to you straight. I'm on a mission. I'm on the hunt to bring you the angels of capitalism. And these are the folks doing the work of this new, more human-centered approach to capitalism. Last week, we talked with Casey Fannin, the president of the National Cooperative Bank, about the shared economic benefits of co-ops. This week, we're going to stay in the co-op space for a little while longer. I'd say you're gonna get a little bit of a twofer this week. Here on the last day of Women's History Month, we're going to talk to arguably the most celebrated marketer of co-ops and also one of less than a handful of women responsible for driving the development of the creation of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial on the National Mall right here in Washington, DC. Let's talk about life and the co-op story of one of America's most beloved agricultural co-ops, the Cabot Creamery Co-op, maker of some of my favorite things in my refrigerator. No, this is not a commercial. I just love them. Today, we're talking with Roberta McDonald, Senior Vice President for Brand Strategy at the Cabot Creamery Cooperative. And now let's welcome to What Does It Profit, Roberta McDonald. Roberta, welcome. Well, thank you. Oh, man, I am so excited to have you on the show, particularly because of the conversation we had last week with Casey Fannin from the National Co-op Bank. And I understand you know Casey. I do. Yeah. Tell us just a a snippet about how you know Casey. I know Casey because of Chuck Snyder, the the president, and more importantly, what he has done for co-ops through the years. He's been one of my heroes. So anyone that works with Chuck or around Chuck is uh, part of my life. Exactly. For our listeners, Chuck Snyder is the real father of the National Co-op Bank, who is grooming Casey Fannin as kind of next generation. And I have to tell you, there is a little bit of a kind of a misunderstanding in the world about co-ops. I'm just going to put it out there. You, you, you in your own way have a brilliant way of saying it. Let's just say it. Don, you are so flattering. And I want you to know that it is not my idea. I actually did research on this early on in the 80s when I came late to Cabot. We did a lot of consumer testing. And one of the things people associated with co-ops is, oh, they're, they're commie plots. Uh, you they're, mean that's not, not true? <laughs> exactly. Seriously. Seriously. Do people really still believe that? Well, they, they think of them as not business-like, not for profit. And and yes, in the Midwest, they definitely thought they were something communistic about, socialistic, I should say, uh, later on about a co-op. It just didn't suit them. Or it was the fruit and granola store, period. That was this extent of the knowledge. And yet, when you dig deeper, well, are you a member of a credit union? Yes. I mean, most people do not acknowledge that they are co-op members. They don't know it. Uh, interesting. Well, we're going to talk some more about that. Let's anchor things by telling folks where you are in the world. So you actually are talking about granola. I think of exactly where you are, which is Vermont. And so you are the senior vice president for Cabot Creamery Cooperative. You you run their their marketing and branding for Cabot. Did I get that quite right? Yeah, it's not really run it. I run with a great pack of people uh, of course, who are responsible of course. for the farmer's brand. And it's it's been a mission for all of us. We're, we're quite passionate about the owners being farmers, which is why we love the co-op model. And it has meant going from bankruptcy to this wonderful place now that we are giving them a, a legitimate living. All right. So this is actually, you put it out there. This is kind of what I want to talk to you about today. I want our listeners to learn a little bit more about you. And then I want to talk about the backstory of the creamery and the co-op and how it all came together and how branding and marketing was so critical because that's the space you came from, I guess, in a way. And let's let's talk about your backstories. Let's give a little context. What generation did you kind of come of age in? I'm a 50s baby. 
Uh huh. And so that means I'm you're a, a 60s, 70s college student. Okay. Okay. So what you have to understand is I'm an army brat, lived all over the world. So not only have I been blessed with a vigorous path in life, it enabled me to smell test people so that I could pretty much float and go anywhere and was consulting at a very young age to big deal companies in New York City, landed a huge job uh, with the San Francisco Opera, and ultimately decided nonprofit was not where it was at. Let me stop you there. That So that was about the 80s time where you were out in California. So what was going on in the world out there in the 80s? Remind those. Everybody that worked for me had a cold. Uh, um, yeah, that's what they called it. Yep. Yeah. Well, tell our listeners what you're referring to. Top of the 80s meant AIDS had come to the United States and was not known what it was. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the first one of the first people that died of AIDS with its name AIDS attended my wedding. And this is in the mid 80s. And my wedding was to a Vietnam vet whom I had kept running into with my work with the Vietnam veterans and the dedicated memorial. Yeah, I'm going to stop you there because this is the end of Women's History Month. And <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to, you're going to tell your story, but I would venture to say that I don't know what's going on in the millennials head, but in mine, I'm a Gen X and it was not an untypical story to follow a boy somewhere. I want to talk about your work with the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And if our listeners don't know what this is, this is an enormously powerful, evocative, emotional memorial smack dab in the middle of the National Mall in Washington, D.C. that commemorates the veterans of the Vietnam War. So use that as a backdrop. It commemorates those who died. Yes, yes. And unlike other veteran memorials, this one is strictly about who died. And it's a gash. It's a black, beautiful black marble gash underground. You can't see it as you drive by. And yes, I worked with Jan Scruggs, who was the founder, Jack Wheeler. And what I want you to know that that was the honor to understand that a Yale Maya Ling designed it, an Asian young woman from Yale University won the design. Well, she was a young person, wasn't she? If I'm remembering she was still that story. Just out of college, yep. Well, extraordinary story. So here to dedicate this memorial was five days. That's what the ad agency I worked with at the time was pro bono. And we had set up sites all over the city to welcome different divisions of the armed services. The Sheraton was the army. And we had the reading of the names at the National Cathedral. And over and over again, I kept running into this fellow and his uh, best friend. And at the end, the team there, Jack, asked me to take some of the people out on the town. I was the only single woman involved. Uh, there was a married woman, uh, mm -hmm. Sandy Oriel, who really helped them raise all the money for the memorial. But so the lone ladies in this posse. We, I know you we guys are the drivers that behind the money and behind all kinds of things. That's a story of women, right? I think women are the key to this evolution that we're experiencing. I've always talked about evolving mothers instead of those founding fathers, but the evolving mothers will embrace for certainly the people that were here before any of us, the Native Americans, and beyond that, the spirit of nurturing and cooperating. It's, it, that is the essence of co-ops. And I can't believe until I got, to, I got to Vermont because I was running into this Vietnam vet who was the first to ask me out <laughs> oh, a love story. Roberta, you haven't heard yet because of our recording schedule, the full episode with Casey Fannin yet. And in that story, he talks about how someone met the love of their life and their spouse and life partner through a co-op. So, I mean, you've got a little bit of that mojo going on, too. But here's the key. What I was doing was something I loved. Yeah. And then you find what you're looking for, but you weren't looking for that. In other yeah. words, to me, it's a real karma ethos, the ethic of giving of yourself or doing, helping people see the vision. Vietnam was hideous for me. It was, uh, my dad was in Vietnam when I was in college. He was a, a commander of a division and on the ground fighting. And the irony is I can't strike like other people. What can I do? I staged debates and then mm -hmm. ultimately helped get the dedication going. So you do what you can about the 
crimes of the generation. Yeah. Well, were you here in Washington with the, all of the big protests? I was in college. I was in the women's branch of UVA at the time, um, Mary Washington. Wow. I mean, think about it now uh, for our listeners who are of a different generation. We think of Mary Washington as being, you know, a different kind of institution. But when you were coming up, it was where you, ne- if you were a female, that's where you need to be. You were in the right place, I guess, at the right time. I was. And um, it was important at that time, not only did we sue UVA to go co-ed, we were experiencing our own Black Lives Matter episode on this kind of cutesy girl community campus. But in fact, there were a lot of great thinkers and doers. So we were we were dislocated, if you will, from the Southern Bell colleges of that era. We were we were people first. Wow. Wow. Well, that's important to the conversation that we're going to have today, and it continues to evolve on our show. Let's hop back into the Cabot story. So you sure. you find yourself going after a boy up to Vermont. Tell us what happened when you got there. I actually just went to his home for Thanksgiving and was just appalled that dirt roads. I had never in my life been off a sidewalk with lights. I was pretty horrified. And I actually only went out with this fellow three times over the course of a year and ultimately was fogged in at his mother's funeral, a 40 year old man living with his mother. You know, how attractive is that? Um, (laughs) We're not going to go there on this show. There are plenty of podcasts (laughs) that can analyze that. But here his uncle was the chairman of the board of the company I work for. He had the same uncle had sold his ad agency to my brother-in-law. So we are so viscerally connected through decades and didn't even know it. And I just abdicated any choice about marrying the man. He asked me after, after the funeral of his mother, gosh, was that romantic? And and I said, I, it's, I said, yes, in a way, because he was a Vietnam vet and to have, and this uncle connection, I just said, Oh, I guess you must be the father of my children. I've been looking for you for a long time. And And from there, the governor, after I commuted for a couple of years, my company back and forth from D.C., part of a large crowd of people that did that, the governor created a job for me as the first director of marketing for the state. And I think we were the first state in the country that had a director of marketing. But wow. You know, now, was, let's let's go back. This was like maybe it, when was this like mid 80s? ish? It was. Yes, it was. It, it was 1985. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So here we are in 85. I came to Washington in 89 to be a political journalist, believe it or not. Didn't work out that way. But I saw Woodward and Bernstein's um, story and all the president's men. And I'm like, I'm going to expose corruption. (laughs) Now here all these decades later, the source of corruption maybe isn't just totally isolated to the political sphere. And maybe it never was, but that's all I knew. No, but you're exposing goodness and intention that is. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what so happens cozy. when, yeah, you you flip the script and start thinking about what God has to say about the nature of work and responsibilities of wealth. It takes you to weird places. So here we are. I'm looking for the angels of capitalism, and I found you. So let's talk <laughs> about what happened. Your chief marketing officer for the state of Vermont, um, what kind of stuff were you working on? Well, interestingly, this state had no idea the value of the name Vermont. And one of the very first things I did among all the departments in the state is we had consumer, they had never heard of this concept, consumer studies on what the name Vermont meant. And remember, this is following, or you couldn't possibly remember, there was the Bob Newhart show with Larry Daryl and Daryl. There was Roberta, my husband is 72, so we watch all that stuff on reruns. So I'm with you. Keep going. Well, we had Diane Keaton doing the organic baby food, which in fact came to be. So you had all this mythology about what Vermont was, but when we really nailed it down, there was a real ache in people, particularly in Manhattan, Boston, and the like, to have something from Vermont. They certainly visited in droves. It was a, It's a state with, at that point in time, Half a million people, I think we're up to 600,000. I call us our governor, the governor of Cincinnati. (laughs) Yeah, I grew up in a hometown with 20,000 people, and I think it must have been 15 churches uh, in the middle of Ohio. So I I get it, uh, like on a smaller scale. Yeah. There's 30 in the South for (laughs) community. There Um, you go. But here I am in Vermont, and and I and they don't even know the, what they have. So I took the food makers to Bloomingdale's because they had so many cool specialty foods. We had them add Vermont to the label. We created promotion groups from everything from granite because they had only focused on headstones and really hadn't 
thought about architectural features, the wood industry, which was just exceptional craftsmanship. And we took all the furniture makers to High Point for the first time. We were the first state to uh, show off there. And Okay, for my listeners, High Point is like Furniture Central in the South. I mean, it's like where it is, where everybody goes to buy from. Right. And we had one furniture maker, the Copeland Furniture, that had been there for years and really encouraged us to put together this this crazy quilt of of, uh, furniture makers. Uh, to join them. But again, and oh, you'll love this trick, Don. I hired a camera guy to go around with Klieg lights and start, start taping the camera. I brought a couple of legislators so they could brag about it, the state spending their money wisely. And again, this is a match with the participants. But that camera, you know, I'm old school PR, and that camera just brought droves of people to our booth. <laughs> you know, you are... Brilliant. I've heard it said that you're an award-winning brand marketer, hands down. Listeners, you can go out and Google all about Roberta. I mean, it's extraordinary. But you're also known for these over-the-top campaigns. So I'm sensing that in the way you describe these cameras. And what what I have to stop you here because I'm a little bit lost in the story. So we (laughs) I love talking to you because we go to all kinds of places. We had you at the state of Vermont doing marketing. And then there were some changes in the governor's administration. Right. That led you over to Cabot. The governor left and Howard Dean was elected. And I realized after three years in Cunin's army and it was all women. It was predominantly women, I should say, in in most of her cabinet positions. She was an enlightened leader, really the first to understand the benefit of early education throughout a person's life. Anyway, just I I adore her, and she's still a dear friend and an incredible poet, and really the first to try to get women to be political. So she, since she had shaped the job for me, uh, where do I go in Vermont? And there were two companies that I was remotely interested in. One was a major ski area and the other was Cabot. And the president got actually asked me to work for him uh, because I had hired his wife for this high point episode. So I get to Cabot and it's this tiny little place and it starts to really hit my heartstrings because it's a co-op of dairy farmers. Um, I meet a couple of them. I'm in love immediately. And this is Montpelier, Vermont. No, it's in Cabot, Vermont. Which oh, is which is the name point. of the town, right? So there's a whole history behind that. It goes, it goes like back to the turn of like two, a century ago. So tell us just a, an ounce about the town of Cabot and how the creamery began there, which then I think leads us nicely into the story about the modern farmers uh, and what's going on. Well, the town of Cabot was named after the bride to be from John Cabot, who You're familiar possibly with the trail in Vancouver. This is a very wealthy Boston family, and this town was created. But the town itself had already started a co-op in 1919, and these were farmers banding together. And what I walked into 80 years later was this little burgeoning cheese company that had started with butter and then cheese. Not it was called American cheddar at the time. Over the last 80 years, a very small the town can't have more than 500 people. I mean, it's wow. It's a little general store. It's like the it's size of, farm. you know, some high schools and big cities. Or one class in one high school. <laughs> yeah, um, it feels like it, right? Yeah, well, I went to Thomas Jefferson, so I can tell you how big it can get. Oh, you're um, right, you're right. Well, let's say you've got this tiny little town. So, so what happens? You get there 80 years later, and you've come off this huge success with the state. I bet you were pretty sought after. So did these dairy farmers come... S- you know, searching for you, saying we need to do something? I just actually went from the state to Cabot without any announcement of availability or looking otherwise. I had just felt right, just decided not to work for Howard and not to work for the new regime, as it were, the Secretary of Commerce, good friend. Just went to Cabot because they said that the farmers really needed me. And I and I love that. I love to be needed. It's so much a part of your end. spirit. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I get it. So what happened when you met the farmers? First of all, remember Manhattan, San Francisco background, D.C. And I had did you never even been a own a pair of boots? Right. <laughs> I had I'd never been on a farm. I'd never touched a teat. I <laughs> tell our I, listeners I, what a teat is before this gets pornographic. Each cow udder has four teats, which is what are milked for literally squoze in 
you squeeze the teat for the milk. Yeah, because most of us go to the grocery store and get our milk. It's an experience. <laughs> okay, so you've got the boots and the cows, and you're you've fallen in love. And but you're also you you have to get you have to get new smells. It's not dog poop the way Manhattan used to smell in the rain. It, this is this is cow manure and. The farmers are coming into their board meeting. They own the company. They're the board of directors and they come in from the barn. So imagine sitting in a closed room with literally boots from the barn and these jackets. And I was, I actually love the smell. Isn't that the weirdest thing? (laughs) That's another show, Roberta. (laughs) Okay, sorry. (laughs) That's okay. So they were in a little bit of trouble, right? Maybe you didn't realize it when you first. I did not realize it two months into the, I started, I had a Mac 125. I built a spreadsheet. There was no cost accounting there. So I started lining up the costs and I lined up the volumes. They had no no real data on where they were sold or what they were doing. There was a VP of sales and marketing. And I pointed out to him that if he had just given everybody a dollar in Albany where he had advertised, he would have actually saved a whole lot of money. Wow, in other words, that's they were a big saving. eye-opener, right? Well, and then they had, we were known for our aged cheddar. And the difficulty when you age a product is milk is a very episodic up and down cost market. And so here they had in the early 90s, put away a lot of cheese in inventory at one price, right? But what happened is when it was going to come out, the price was just precipitously low. And that meant certain bankruptcy. So we we weren't even sure sometimes if we were going to make next week's payroll. And I can remember playing uh, music top volume throughout the plant, simply the best. It was, it was frightening. The Anyway, I think that's no, enough to Ro- say. No, Roberta, real- that's, that's the thing, right? We all kind of have these mojo songs. I've been talking to guests about it. I just think that there's something that music says that can put together people in a way that's just very visceral. It's like you get it. And so I love that song, Simply the Best. It's shown up in car commercials and other things since then. But um, I think you were onto something. So here you had to figure out how to help this group of farmers figure out what to do next. So I understand there was a an M&A transaction in the process. What happened? I became an M&A junkie. I realized if I had found this work first, I would never have, I would never have left Manhattan because I love numbers. I love projecting. And what what happened was because we were in such trouble, you know, and I think I think we may have owned six percent of the company and the bank owned the rest. Beautiful, yeah. brilliant co-bank. <laughs> they saved us. But yeah. we had three groups come in to try to buy us, a group of philanthropists from Vermont, a real wealthy gentleman that the CEO was backing. And then this group of farmers from Massachusetts, Agrimark, it was also a co-op. And there was the, literally courtship and presentations to the farmers. And I was on the side of the farmers and the CEO was on the side of let's cut it and make money because he actually had come up with the Cabot brand in the mid eighties. He had been head of sales. His dad had been the general manager for years. So it was this almost Shakespearean time of the company where the father said the son couldn't, would run the company into the ground and the son is fighting with the wealthy people to take over the brand. And take it places because they had cash. And then there's the farmers who wanted to ensure their future. So it was a heady time and the Agrimark prevailed. And so that means the farmers prevailed. The farmers prevailed. And I can remember being the dutiful general's daughter going into the new CEO and said, I'm going to submit my resignation <laughs> you know, because there's a new leader. He goes, are you crazy? No. <laughs> you know what that reminds me of? The movie Invictus about Nelson Mandela when he came in to form a government and he was worried of the predecessor staff was worried that they were going to get cut. And Mandela just said, you know, look, we need you all for kind of reconciliation. We need you to kind of make this happen. So I'm, I'm feeling like you had a Nelson Mandela moment. <laughs> That, what an honor that is. I love this man that came in. Richie Stammer was uh, this Rutgers professor as an economist turned uh, co-op executive. And he actually very successfully during our uh, 100th anniversary celebration, all of 2019, we inducted him into the Cabot Hall of Fame. And it was no small effort. But the man is my hero. And wow. Anyway, he he just appreciated that we had this all this farmer promotion stuff sort of in our hip pocket, which we couldn't bring out. 
So from there, we started, I'm a farmer, I'm an owner, and we got t-shirts on our farmers and to go into the grocery stores as long as they promise not to wear them in the barn. And <laughs> that's how the brand turned. And it went from, I can remember my first budget was $25,000. And I remember turning, writing people checks from my own checking account when they were complaining about the cottage cheese or something. Wow. Anyway, it, it, to think how far we've come now. Well, tell our listeners working. how many farmers, your market size and where you are now. I mean, you're a beloved brand. I hope we're beloved. I, you know, I, Are you kidding? We eat mac and cheese at industrial scale in my household. <laughs> Oh, that makes the farmers so happy. Exactly. We actually, here's the here's the interesting thing over the last 30 years. When we started the merger, we were 1,400 farm families. But what's what's happened on the farm is nobody wants to work seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I, I just don't know why that is. Imagine uh, that. I, it could be Netflix or it could be just like modern I, life I says know. life's different now. It's it's grueling. Unless farms get together with their neighbors and form one bigger farm, or you've got several generations that you work some jobs off the farm. I can't tell you the number where the wife is a nurse or works in the school system for the benefits because farmers don't have benefits. You know, there's no um, union. There's no, you can't, you know, you're sick. You still have to get out and milk the cows two or three times a day. So it is a grueling profession. And People have flat out aged out. And so it started in uh, 1992 as 1,400 farmers. We're down to 800 today or maybe 752. Who knows? Mm. And but it, but there's no less milk. In other words, farmers have become more efficient. Our farmers have pledged not to use RBST, so I don't want anybody to leap to a technical solution yeah, for that. Yeah, well, tell our listeners, we use acronyms all the time. Tell us what that alphabet soup was that you just said. Sure, there was a... I mean, you a, don't have to go scientific, but basically it's like no, the no, bad stuff it's, in the... It's recombinant bovine somatropin, and it, it basically is a growth hormone that extends the lactation period in a cow from... They, they naturally go off, they dry up after they've given birth, they dry up and then they start milking again. But this would extend that period. And our farmers don't use it. It has a, a great deal of concern in the in the public, so they don't use it. But nevertheless, the Well, that's the a distinguisher become, for your brand. I mean, it's it, it kind it of is, talks about it, the values of, of the farmers. But there's a lot to be said for these people love their animals. They're not going to do something... First of all, I think when the world's in terrible state, sometimes you worry about things that you shouldn't worry about. And one of the things is I don't want anyone to worry about how our farmers take care of their animals because they do everything that's the best and the right for them. It's their livelihood. They are not going to jeopardize it. And in dairy farming, there's no short-term solutions. It's ongoing care that maintains a healthy animal. And they're, that's the truth of it. In the meantime, they've built this great brand together and they've assured themselves of a livelihood. And so we go from bankruptcy to last year was the best year in the history of the company. And it meant during COVID that people stuck at home ordered Cabot over any other brand in the Northeast, for example. And everywhere we existed, I think the ethic of our brand was purchased as much as the high quality of the taste. Well, you know, I have chills because that's what companies aspire to. You know, it's to have that brand loyalty that you've found the the secret sauce to steal from McDonald's. It's like the recipe that, no pun intended, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I go, I could go on all day. I'm going to just stop right there. But I guess what I really wanted to say was that I, we look for the angels of capitalism and cooperatives, I think, don't get enough attention when we talk about our economy, but you all are everywhere. Everywhere. Um, and Casey Fannin talked about this last week. One of the things that I've seen in, you know, doing our team has been doing some homework on the work you've been doing over the last 30 years, and we haven't even scratched the surface. But one of the things that we saw as an initiative at Cabot was really celebrating volunteerism. And you've got this really cool app Now you've been working on for a long time. There's been some impact from COVID, but tell our listeners about the investment that the farmers made in their values. I, I love that question, Don. And let me just say that farmers are the first to volunteer in their communities. I don't care if it's drive the bus, serve on the city council, EMTs. They don't get to go anywhere but their town, right? And that they are fundamental to that community's health and well-being time and time again. That value 
is exactly what we try to represent in our brand. And so we have tapped into this amazing, throbbing pulse of America, which is all about volunteering. And we have been partners with Create the Good with AARP, a points of light. Volunteers are the heartbeat of communities. And for us, the app, the Reward Volunteers app, is a way to document the time people give because we believe that time is the way the not so wealthy give wealth. Time being the most valuable commodity we have. We think it might be money and we hope it's faith. But the reality is it's time that and how do you use it? So we honor the people who use it as, the, as well as our farmers do, who stop to see the long shadow in the summer, late summer across a field, of the tree. They, they savor the moment. Wow. I love the way you describe this because later this season, we're going to be talking about a movement put into place that was purely for people of goodwill, ecumenical, you mentioned faith, by Pope Francis. And it was this idea that the economy should be more human-centered and we should value all of the resources that we all share, which include the animals and the planet and everybody else. And you guys are living this. It's the, you know, I I may have confessed you, Don, that I was raised Catholic and I not that religion bears a lot into my life choices, but I can tell you that I learned early on that you must find purpose. Can I ask you, when you're talking about purpose, can I ask you the quintessential show question, which is helping people understand all of this. I see your life and everything you've done as kind of witness to all of this. It's embedded into who you are as a kind of, it's in your DNA, this this idea of you know, self-giving and, and, and all of this. And maybe I'm not categorizing it the way you would, but how do you see who you are and the work that you do uh, as profiting your soul, your, your person? So, Don, here's the real secret. There is no me here. I am such a conduit for everyone I've loved and met. And the more that I give, there it is just remarkable. I truly get back. So karma is much more instantaneous with me than most people. But the notion of giving actually should have been taught as one of the absolute catechism questions, you know, that giving really creates happiness. It is a, it's the easiest way to be happy. That and dancing to crazy music. But Oh, yeah, yeah. Ask Logan Scott from <laughs> Disney about dancing. Oh, yeah. And, and me, I just love music. My listeners are you know, probably sick of hearing it, but I think everybody has kind of a mojo song. Do you have a mojo song? Let's see. What's the latest one? Oh, it's so crazy. I got it from uh, Saturday Night Live. Nick Jonas, I'm in Heaven. You are so like cool, Roberta. <laughs> All what? right. I'm going to ask you one more question before we let you go. And kind of just the same one, said in a different way. As we create the opportunities to think about the economy differently, how does it profit all of us? How does it profit the common good? I don't want to make anybody do anything that they don't want. I, I truly believe, and it's why I love the farmers, their idea of life is, slow, is savoring such moments and they understand that enough is enough. How can somebody really live knowing Syria is going on or the border, take it closer to home? What can you do? Well, I look down right in front of me. And every time I hear about a, a child removed from a parent, I'll go to a local place and just do something nice about that are helping children with their parents. In other words, if we would all just look down and act locally and be as good as we can there, go ahead and, and acquire as much wealth as you want, but share enough so that your community is thriving. If Then we can look up and out to the world. But I do meditate on the horrible things that are going on in the world. I do not not think about them. I think it's important to appreciate that's going on. and. And what we have is so extraordinarily good and do what we can. Wow, Roberta, this could be like a nine hour podcast. I just want to keep talking <laughs> and talking. And no, no, so no, 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 no. It's perfect because this enables me to ask you back. So Roberta <laughs> from Cabot Creamery Co-op and all the things that are good. Thank you so much for joining us on What thank Does you, It Don. Profit? And on behalf of our farm families, I really want to thank you for 
um, mentioning Cabot and just being the good woman and good soul that you are. Oh, amen, soul sister. I'm on this journey with you. Okay, deal. Okay. Bye now. Take care. You've been listening to What Does It Profit? Thanks to those who've gotten the word out about the show. As you're hearing this episode, I'm off in New York City on a photo shoot. We have a jam-packed itinerary, which includes, weather permitting, a visit to Kristen Vispel's bronze statue of the fearless girl. This statue was commissioned by State Street Bank four years ago in anticipation of International Women's Day. It depicts a four-foot-tall little girl facing down the iconic charging bull of Wall Street, smack dab right in front of the New York Stock Exchange. You may not know this, but after the statue was placed here, there was drama and it had to be moved. Well, as you can imagine, just you wait. I'm coming with a photographer to step into those little girl's shoes and make a big, bold statement that something's gotta give. Things are changing. Thanks, State Street Bank, for the Corporate Gender Equity Index. Thanks to all the bold and brave women CEOs, board members, and shareholders. There you have it. What does it profit's bookend to Women's History Month? In our next episode, we're going global. We're going to talk about giving a whole new soul to the global economy. We're going to introduce you to the economy of Francesco. This is the global movement inspired by Pope Francis and the patron saint of peace himself, St. Francis of Assisi. Our conversation will take us from Washington to Rome and to Brazil as we learn about the excitement and fruitfulness of several thousand young economists, entrepreneurs, and changemakers from across the globe who believe that the economy can do better for all of us. Subscribe wherever you listen so that you don't miss a beat. In the meantime, follow us on social media to keep up with the show and to help us build the What Does It Profit community. Again, we're hanging out mostly right now on LinkedIn and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends about the show. You can meet our team and sign up for our weekly newsletter on our website, whatdoesitprofitpodcast.com. What Does It Profit is written and hosted by me, Dr. Dawn Carpenter. The show is produced by Jordan Gosporé and edited by Switch and Board Studios. And the executive producer is me. Special thanks to our talented interns, Niels, Hannah, and Sean, other team members, and our long and illustrious group of friends and supporters can be found at whatdoesitprofitpodcast.com. Before I let you go, let me remind you to never stop asking yourself, what does it profit? <laughs>